had an introduction. We've had a few talks in this meeting about twisted bilayer graphene. So just very quickly, let me tell you, we are taking talking about two layers of graphene twisted stacked on top of one another. And uh, as it was sort of discovered uh, in the, you know, in 2011 uh, or 10 by a number of groups, uh, particularly McDonald and collaborators uh, at a magic angle of about one degree, uh, the, the Moray superstructure of these two layers of graphene uh, gives rise to an interference effect basically that, that gives us these very flat bands, uh, two flat bands uh, near the chemical potential and near the charge neutrality. So we have two bands, we call them the upper and lower or conduction or valence flat bands. And uh, when you include the relaxation effects as it's been shown by a number of people, uh, the remote bands kind of pull away from these flat bands to, so energetically they can be quite isolated. And, and we have uh, graphene. So of course we have valley degrees of freedom and we have uh, a, a spin as well, uh, which gives us basically uh, the electronic system with uh, eight flavors, if you wish, uh, two bands, two spins, two valleys, uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, my pointer is dying. So hopefully I can do this. Uh oh, no, it's saying something. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. Okay, that's fine. All right. So we're basically putting electrons into this manifold uh, with eight uh, flavors. And uh, Pablo Jerry Herrera, that made these samples for the first time in a controlled way, uh, discovered that when you partially fill these bands, uh, you get a correlated insulating phase. So in particular, the correlated insulators are more stable when you have uh, two electrons in this manifold of eight, or you have six electrons in this manifold of eight. And um, doping away from this new equals minus two or plus two, that's how we, we keep our counting. The convention in this talk is gonna be eight electrons going from minus four uh, to plus four. Uh, you dope away and you get superconductivity. So of course, this diagram looks a lot like the superconductors we've heard about, for example, in this meeting, and trying to understand both the nature of the correlated state, the insulator, the normal state that's correlated, as I'll show you today, and superconductivity uh, is kind of the mystery. And of course, uh, having a very large density of states uh, associated with flat bands, uh, you might just wonder, this could be just a conventional superconductor, small amount of electron phonon interaction may be enough to give us superconductivity. So whether the role of electronic correlations is important is something that would be nice to experimentally establish. The role of topolo topology of these bands, we are, we are borrowing basically states from graphene. Uh, graphene has this uh, Barry curvature, this uh, Barry phase uh, associated with the Dirac point and what that does to the band structure and the nature of pairing, what kind of pairing interaction can we get are among the key questions. So today I'm gonna to tell you how we use the scanning tunneling microscope uh, to look at this system. And I'll show you, it's actually quite nice. This is probably the first electronic system where we can tune the material in, in our experimental setting from the interacting to the non-interacting limit by filling and emptying these flat bands and, and watching what happens to the spectroscopic properties. I'm gonna focus quite a bit on superconductivity and what we see in terms of the spectroscopic property of the superconducting phase. Uh, and I'm going to show you some things about topological phases. And if there's time, I'll tell you where we are headed uh, in the lab. So uh, the way these samples are made is uh, basically by stack and tearing. Uh, you can take a piece of graphene, which you have scotch tape on a piece of silicon. There are many different methods of ripping graphene apart into two pieces. And you use basically these polymers uh, glued to basically a glass slide to pick up pieces of graphene and stack them on top of one another. And uh, we use boron nitride as a substrate underneath to isolate the sample from gates. And our transport colleagues also encapsulate their samples with boron nitride on top. What we are of course going to do vacuum tunneling experiments with the SDM. We only have boron nitride on one side and gate only on one side of the sample. Now uh, we have worked very hard to get very clean samples, question. Excellent question. That actually matters. And actually, if you look at uh, the question was, is boron nitride aligned and does it matter? And the question of what the boron nitride does is very important because boron nitride can break the graphene AB sublattice symmetry 
and I could get gap the Dirac points, uh, which are actually here in these flat bands as well. And that will come up a little bit later. But that's actually one of the powers of the SDM. Actually, if you look at this image, you can see a, a lot of different features it, on a very fine scale. It's not this scale, it's finer than that. It actually is the graphene, is the, is the carbon atoms, which you cannot really see in this projector, but it, they are there. <laughs> then there is a, 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 a finer scale that sort of uh, you can see here, not the, the, the bright uh, spots, but within the bright spots. That's actually a moray that's created because of the misalignment of the boron nitride underneath with the two graphene uh, uh, sheets that are almost aligned with one another. They're about one degree. So that's one moray superstructure. And then you have this other moray superstructure that comes from this one degree angle misalignment of the two uh, graphene layers. And what structurally that, that, that means is that within the regions that are very bright, uh, which, which we call AA stacking, is your graphene are almost aligned with one another. The two hexagonal lattices are right on top of one another. And they go out of register and they go into the register and so on as you go out uh, into this uh, superstructure of the moray. So a unit cell of a moray is, involves 10,000 atoms, which is, makes this a very difficult problem uh, to solve uh, the band structure of. So you have these continuum models that you've heard about. Okay, so why do you see these bright spots? Uh, actually, if you go to the uh, uh, McDonald uh, continuum model, uh, you see that these bright spots are associated with the enhanced density of states of the, uh, of the flat bands. So electrons for the flat bands basically live in these AA sites, uh, which will become kind of relevant in, in parts of this talk. So we have a gate underneath and, um, uh, and we can tune basically the, the electronic structure to fill and empty the flat bands. And when you do spectroscopy, when the flat bands are completely full, you see two very sharp peaks near the chemical potential. You notice that they're below the chemical potential. And um, uh, this is total gives you a sense of the bandwidth involved with these flat bands. There's about 12 milli electron volts uh, uh, and each one of them, uh, whether they are filled or empty, they roughly have the same uh, kind of shape. And of course, all the action is happens when you partially fill these uh, states. Now, um, uh, the kind of data I'll show you in this talk looked a lot like this, uh, where we, at, on one axis, we have the tip sample tunneling, okay? The two peaks that you saw here are these two flat lines, for example, here, uh, up here about 40, uh, 40 gate voltage, uh, which when you have uh, the flat bands completely occupied below the chemical potential, and then you can tune them through the chemical potential and get all the way to minus four, where you could completely depleted them, okay? So there's a lot going on in this slide, uh, but there is kind of two key features I want you to notice. The first one is that uh, the way you read this slide is we, we go in gate voltage down, we go up here, we go down again, and so forth. As soon as we partially fill these flat bands, those sharp peaks in the spectroscopic properties of these states become extremely broad. And this is a, a feature that we first notice. Um, you see it's very broad here, it's very broad here as well here, and all, all the way here when they, you start exiting the flat band, they, they begin to be sharp again. So this broadness of the, uh, uh, this broadness of the spectroscopic property of the flat band is a, a signature of strong interactions. Uh, and it's telling us about very strong charge fluctuations that are taking place in these flat bands, which makes the quasi particles extremely broad when you, when you partially fill these states which is quite interesting. Now, if you look a little bit carefully, you notice that there are finer features that are kind of going on in this data. In fact, if you look here, you see that there is sort of a repeating uh, features, which I'll bring out by taking, this is DIDV, and I can take DIDV and normalize it by I over V, which is measured for every curve. And what that does is basically normalizes the fact that the tip actually, the tip height can be slightly different between each of those spectra because the spectroscopic property of the system is changing. Now, what you notice here is, is this cascade of features in the data. Uh, and you can kind of see that the cascade of features involve some spectral property that comes from near the chemical potential goes out and then it resets again, goes out, resets again. And it happens every uh, basically quarter filling within these bands. So the system knows that it has these flavors uh, four, four up here and four down here uh, when you sweep the, 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 the carrier density. 
these are at very high temperatures. Uh, this is not when the system is an insulator or a superconductor. This can be observed up to you know, 20 Kelvin or so. What is causing this? Uh, uh, you get a question. The what say? Yes. Yeah, I would say the broadening, it's like 40 millivolts energy scale. So I don't think it's very sensitive to temperature. The broadening is, it, it, I think it, it goes on to like 10, 20 Kelvin. The question was the, what the, what, to what temperature does the broadening can be observed? I would say 10, 20 Kelvin is. So more or less like the uh, cascades or yeah. are independent. Do you, uh, do you observe a change in the density of state uh, independently of the cascade? I would say we haven't measured it carefully enough, but my, my intuition is, you know, about 20 Kelvin or so, all these features begin to show up together. Now, one thing uh, you notice is that uh, this, this data is a little bit different. This actually data taken not with the tip over AA sites, it's the, the tip over the AB sites. And when you put the tip over the AB sites, you become very sensitive to not the flat bands, but the remote bands. That's where they have the largest density of state. And you see out here at higher energies, which is where the remote bands are, these are the remote bands. You see that the edge of the remote band shows these sort of uh, cascades of features uh, sort of in line with what you saw in the last uh, slides. If I just simply interpret the edge of this band as some single particle state for tunneling into that edge of that band, plus what the chemical potential of the system is doing, what we find is that the chemical potential shows this resetting behavior every quarter filling. Uh, in the data. Actually, direct measurements of the chemical potential was done also with an SET by Shahal Ilani's group. And they also observed, actually, it's eerily the same. Uh, the, the numbers even match between these two very different experiments uh, uh, done on the same system, which is nice. So this resetting is something that uh, uh, one can try to have different theories of. We have a very simple idea of how to understand this resetting. And our, our simple idea is that, well, you know, if you look at the SDM images, they, they kind of look like electrons are living on the AA sites. It kind of looks like a quantum dot. And you can just think about the quantum dot. Of course, there is hopping between the dots. I don't know how to solve that problem. So let's ignore the hopping. We think it's very small because the flat bands are very flat. And essentially just think about, uh, a, 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 you know, a number of quantum dots with, with basically eight flavors. And, uh, and all you're doing is you're asking what's the, what's the energetics of adding and removing electrons to these dots. And if you go through that exercise, you basically have, of course, the energy of the levels. If you just say there are two levels, E and minus E, not. And then there is an on-site Coulomb repulsion, U, within each dot. Of course, you can make this more model more sophisticated. Uh, but with this very simple model, you can sort of convince yourself that there will be, of course, jumps in the chemical potential every time you go through filling each of the flavors. And, uh, and these jumps in the chemical potential and, and the associated addition and removal spectral features that you see in a calculation of this simple model is one which tells us roughly the size of the Coulomb repulsion in this system. Uh, these features can be interpreted kind of like an addition removal spectra as you go through each of these filling states. Uh, within this simple, you know, infinite U uh, Hubbard model. What's interesting about this is that this exercise tells you that the energy of the interaction is about 23 milli electron volts. So the size of the Coulomb repulsion you get from this simple model is larger than the bandwidth of, of, of the system, okay, by, by a lot, okay? And uh, I, of course, you know, you need a theory of these features uh, and that remains to be fully done. And uh, one idea that's uh, being explored right now in trying to understand our kind of data uh, and put it together with, of course, the fact that the system is conducting and, and showing extended electronic state is to think about the fact that maybe uh, you can think of the system as having two flavors of electrons, localized electrons on the AA sites and electrons that are conducting on the, on the AB site, which are, have a band structure very similar to just bilayer graphene. Uh, uh, which is, you know, ignoring twisting. And this is a work of Andre Bernevik uh, uh, and Song, uh, which are building this heavy fermion model uh, of, of the system, which is, I think, quite interesting uh, as well to try to see whether you can recover some of the spectroscopic feature from such a model.
Okay, so just uh, before I get to superconductivity, let me quickly tell you that, of course, these bands are topological. And, and the way this was first exhibited experimentally uh, came to light was when uh, people made samples that accidentally were aligned with boron nitride. And when you align these uh, uh, graphene samples with boron nitride, the Dirac points, which are very hard to see in this band structure, if you zoom into them, basically they get gapped out by the presence of the breaking of the AB symmetry. And it was a discovery of uh, anomalous Hall effect and quantized anomalous Hall effect as well. In samples, it, it, it one, in one particular filling of, of, new, uh, of, three elect, of, of uh, seven electrons in the system uh, showing uh, uh, basically churn number of one. What we discovered was that even if the samples are not aligned with boron nitrite, and if you cool the samples down uh, uh, to millikelvins, uh, you, we find that at, at some uh, values uh, in presence of small fields, the system exhibit these gaps uh, that come in the spectra and it looks like this. So this is the same kind of spectra I've been showing you before. The colors represents the, the DIDV, the tunneling density of state. And this dark blue region here is a presence of a gap that opens at the chemical potential. Uh, and this turns on at some particular value of density. You see it's not mu equals mono, mono two. This is at some value of magnetic field. And what we find is these gaps can basically be moved around. They, they move around as you change the value of the magnetic field in the density and a magnetic field uh, uh, you know, knobs that you can turn. And Essentially, you can show uh, that this is a signature of a formation of a churn insulating state. And a churn insulating state with a quantized hull conductance, of course, has a gap in the bulk. But this quantized hull conductance, uh, 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 the, the quantized hull state and the gap basically are such that if you change the density and the magnetic field, uh, you have to, you, you basically are changing where the gap occurs in density and following essentially how this gap moves as a function of magnetic field uh, in flux per unit cell as, and as a function of the filling factor, you can actually back out the churn number associated with those gaps. So essentially what this plot is, is that every, uh, at every density, you find the gap at every magnetic field and you change the field and follow where the gap is. And from the, this is called the strata formula. And from the slope of this line, uh, you can basically extract the churn number associated with this state. So uh, this is something we found uh, in, in STM and it's also been seen in transport studies and other STM groups and, and also with the SET experiments, which also measure uh, the gap uh, in uh, using the um, uh, you know, compressibility measurement as well. So these systems, these, these, these phases are caused by interaction. They're not caused by you know, a, you know, a single particle effect uh, alignment with the BN and so on. This is purely from the interaction in the system and it needs a little bit of magnetic field to get stabilized. Question. The, gap same the, the size of the gap. Uh, that's a good question. It's very hard actually to measure the gap precisely because when you are getting an insulating phase, you actually have a charging effect that adds to the, to the size of the gap you measure in the tunneling experiment. So, but, um, I think it, it, that's a good question. We have to look at the compressibility measurement because they're not so sensitive. Uh, they can actually measure the gap directly, the thermodynamic gap. This is a tunneling gap. Okay, so these bands are also topological. All right, so now let's talk about superconductivity. So the superconductivity is most robust in this system around the new equals minus two uh, insulating state. I think maybe we'll answer the questions from the chat at yeah. the end, or you want to read it? Right. Okay, so the question is, what mimics the magnetic fluxes in uh, twisted bilayer graphene on boron nitride to give rise to the quantized anomalous volume effect? So this is, this is actually magnetic field we are applying to actually measure the strata formula. So we apply the magnetic field, uh, and basically look how the gap changes. So threading flux actually is happened experimentally. It's not a fictitious flux. Okay, so this is the same kind of data I was showing you before, but now zoomed in uh, close to the chemical potential and also measured at, at 200 millikelvin electron temperature. And what you see here is 
low conductivity near the charge neutrality point, okay? Uh, this is not insulating. This sample is not insulating at charge neutrality. And minus two, actually, the sample has a insulating state. I'll, I'll show you that a little bit more carefully in a moment. And then we see a gap that develops at low temperatures re near nu equals minus two. This actually nu equals minus two gap closes and reopens. Another gap opens between minus two and minus three. And this is where our transport colleagues have found superconductivity uh, in these materials. So the first thing is how do you distinguish two gap phases? Uh, and this is, of course, it would be nice to do transport experiments simultaneously, but the, our devices are actually relatively big. And even if you measure transport experiment and show zero resistance, you're not really sure it's really coming from the area under your tip. It could be percolating somewhere else. So we, we realized we could use the tip to do Andrea reflection experiment. And uh, this experiment turned out to be more complex than we first thought, which I'll talk about a little bit today. But just to, uh, just to remind you, in a conventional S-wave superconductor, if you uh, are in the tunneling mode, uh, you of course measure the BCS tunneling gap. And if you uh, make a contact between the a normal metal and a superconductor, you, you have a conductance which is bias dependent. And at the at energies below the energy of the gap, you have the Andreev reflection process where electron from the normal metal is uh, retro reflected and a Cooper pair goes across. Uh, and uh, this of course is a situation where uh, your conductivity is enhanced, if you wish. Half of this junction is superconducting. So when you go below this gap energy, uh, the conductance will be doubled in the ideal case of an Andrea reflection from a um, S-wave superconductor. So we went along looking for such a signal. And, um, and actually there were Andrea reflection experiments also on D-wave superconductors. We'll discuss that in a moment. Um, and uh, we found that uh, indeed at, at low temperatures, uh, below about one Kelvin in the region between minus two and minus three. I'll show you the gate dependence more carefully in a second. Uh, you see this enhanced conductance of about 30% or so uh, from a contact re resistance where this is about five kilo ohms uh, or, uh, or, or, or so uh, in, the, in the resistance channel. And so this is a signature of superconductivity. Okay, so this is, this is nice. So we can put this side by side so we can take an area of the sample, perform tunneling spectroscopy, find uh, the gaps, correlated insulator gap, what looks like a superconducting gap. And then we can say goodbye to this area because we're going to crash the tip into it because it is no longer recoverable for STM measurement and uh, record this uh, point contact spectroscopy. And what you notice here is uh, purple is low conductance and, and, and orange is high conductance. You notice that you can, it's very nice. You can see, oh, that's the, that's the new equals minus four. This is the ordinary insulator. This sample is a sort of semi-metallic at charge neutrality. At plus two and minus two, you have an insulating phase. But then here, if you look carefully, this is the Andreev signal that we are measuring uh, between, uh, between these two phases. This gap, this state is gapped, but it has an Andreev signal when you crash the tip into the sample. So very good. So we, we, we know we have a superconductor. So now let's look at the spectroscopic property of the superconductor. So uh, this is actually a nice plot. Uh, this actually shows a very important feature, which is the nu equals minus two insulating gap closes before what appears to be like a superconducting gap opens, okay? This is actually very different than what we see in the cooperates, for example. Um, so here uh, are representative from two different devices. When you're in the middle of the, the largest superconducting region of the sample, and you see that the tunneling spectra has this coherence peak. It has this very V-shaped looking curve. Sometimes it hits zero and sometimes it doesn't. This is actually very characteristic of things we have seen in the cooperates. Uh, we see this you know, V-shaped gap and it not always touches zero and it doesn't look like your uh, ordinary one Kelvin aluminum superconductor, uh, which we can easily measure in this instrument and see the BCS density of states. So now you can start uh, playing around and try to fit this curve with you know, S wave. If you take a simple S wave, you have to broaden the data beyond uh, you know, what's reasonable to fit such, a, such spectra, like you know, two Kelvin or something, which is not reasonable. If you just assume a nodal superconductor, with very you know, small broadening, you, you can fit this experimental results. 
Okay, so this is all very good. Uh, one thing I should say is that the two delta over KTC, if you, uh, if you interpret this as a superconducting gap, is something like 25, okay? Now, comes the interesting parts. We take the sample, we warm it up above one Kelvin. I showed you that the Andreev signal go, went away. But if I look at the tunneling measurement with the tip far away, it, it still shows a pseudo gap. Okay. So that it shows a pseudo gap. So this is very interesting. So this is the thing down here. This is the data at four Kelvin. Uh, you can, you can, this is answering some of your question. For example, you can see the cascades are very clear uh, in this sample uh, at four Kelvin already. And um, the size of it is very hard to interpret experimentally because, of course, there is thermal broadening as you warm up to four Kelvin. But what you can do, uh, let me go forward. Uh, missing a slide. Let me go forward. Ah, I'm missing a slide. Which I want to show you. Interesting. Sorry, it has disappeared. Okay, uh, maybe I'll get it up during the question session. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, we can, of course, in this experiment, suppress superconductivity with a very small magnetic field when you apply the field perpendicular to the sample. So with just about half a Tesla or even a hundred milli Tesla, the, the, the superconductivity in both Andrea reflection and transport studies go away. But this pseudo gap is, is still there and it's actually rather sharp, okay? So if you compare the zero Tesla and half a Tesla and one Tesla data, you find that this gap in the spectroscopic properties is, it's sensitive, it's filling in as you, as you turn on the magnetic field, uh, but it, it actually retains most of its characteristic, even when the sample is not showing the real zero resistance state. So, you know, you could ask whether this is due to some pairing without phase coherence or whether this is due to some other ordering phenomena that needs to turn on before superconductivity is possible. Okay. Right. So now um, let me talk about the fact that if you do these two different experiments, you also seem to observe sort of two energy scales in this problem. So in the tunneling experiment, uh, the gaps we see are about two delta over KTC of 25. But when we do our Andrea reflection, we somehow see a smaller energy scale in the experiment associated with this enhanced conductance, okay? And this is um, of the order of four to six. I don't know quite how to interpret these things, uh, but uh, the fact that there are these two energy scales may, may be important in, the, in, in this problem. And here's a sort of a plot of what it looks like. This is quite sample dependent, but this is a plot of what it looks like uh, for one particular sample. Uh, so the blue is the, the, the tunneling gap. The red is the energy scale you get from the Andrea reflection, which is smaller. And I've also plotted here the correlated insulator gap uh, for you. Uh, which is turning on and off near nu equals minus two. So what's interesting about this is that this is actually quite different than the coup rates. This, the gap that we call the pseudo gap in the coup rates when we go to under dope samples would continue to rise as you approach the mod insulator. Uh, here, this gap seems to die before some other gap turns on, uh, which is associated with our insulating states. So this could be, this would be important in understanding the nature of this correlated insulator and its connection uh, to the superconducting phase. So the energy scale being two different, uh, th that's different from the coup rate, but what is similar to the coup rates is that there seems to be some experiment, for example, in Andrea reflection in the coup rates, this was done in the sideway tunneling, sideway Andrea reflection into high TC coup rates. There is, that turns on at TC and it has some energy scale. And there is another energy scale, which is a sort of the pseudo gap, which as I just told you, goes up and up uh, as, it, as it goes higher. So the fact that there are two energy scales, and sometimes in under dope samples in tunneling spectroscopy, this is a sample, which is TC is like uh, 60 Kelvin down here. 
uh, you can actually see two energy scales in the tunneling spectrum. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there is a question of whether you associate this energy scale associated with superconductivity. Uh, this is uh, the pseudo gap, this is, remains to be still fully understood in the cuprates. So there are these connections. Now, let me also mention that uh, in addition to twisted bilayer graphene, there is an experiment on twisted trilayer graphene, which is also a superconductor. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a work by Stevan Najpergi's group, very similar experiments than the one I showed you. Um, what they also observe is that there, there is a region where uh, you have a correlated insulator, and then there is a region where you have superconductivity. Uh, curiously, in the region they think they have superconductivity, uh, there is either a U-shaped curve or a V-shaped curve uh, in, their, in their spectra. This is a paper that's online. But I think now I think they have repeated this experiment also doing Andrea reflection, just like I showed you. And I think it's only in the, in the V-shaped area that they see an Andrea signal. And we have to look at that very carefully. Okay, so uh, since this work has been published, there's been a couple of people who've been interested in trying to understand, understand our experiment. I think maybe you heard from Leonid Glasman who was here uh, about, uh, uh, you know, Andrea reflection in a nodal superconductor. And there is also, uh, previous to that, there is work by Cento, which is online analyzing kind of all the different evidence from all different experiments concerning the pairing symmetry question in, in the bilayer graphene. So one thing that uh, we kind of, we kind of didn't think about was uh, in detail about how would you, how does, the de how does the process of Andrea reflection works in a nodal superconductor? So, um, if you think about a nodal superconductor, of course, the, the phase of the order parameter is changing as you, as you go around in all directions. And if you have a process by which you think about not, not tunneling, but under reflecting from a point in the system, from a single point, and uh, compute basically the si under reflection signal, uh, uh, adding up all the phases from all the direction, of course, you end up at, at zero voltage, you end up with actually zero under reflection signal. So all plus and minuses of the order parameter cancels. So it became kind of a mystery to try to sort out with Sentinel and Leonid that, so if you compute uh, from a point, you get this, uh, the signal should look uh, like this, the IDV versus V should basically go to zero. Uh, this is Sentinel's calculation, and this is uh, Leonid and Felix and their uh, postdoc. Uh, calculation. And, you know, the, the, the way maybe they thought about understanding our experiment is sort of like a fine tuning, uh, adding some component. Maybe you have an S wave that's anisotropic and, you know, but the, the, the reality of our experiment is that this V shaped tunneling gap is very insensitive uh, to, to gate voltage, basically. So if you change the density of the sample, you still see this V shaped curve uh, and it doesn't change very much. Now, in Sentinel's calculation, they also considered the possibility uh, that you have a, a, a Andre reflection process in which you conserve momentum. So when you Andre reflect from one point, you don't think about momentum conservation. So they consider, well, maybe this experiment somehow conserves momentum, okay? And you might ask, how would that be possible? Hold that thought for a moment. And if you, if you do that calculation, you do in fact uh, expect to see a enhancement in the uh, low energy conductance with the, for the Andreev process if you conserve uh, momentum. So this got me thinking, uh, 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 me and my students thinking about what did we actually do in the lab? So this was a kind of a fun uh, exercise. So here's what the signal is when the tip is very far away. Yeah, question? So, so the, it incorporates essentially uh, Andrea reflection was mostly done in a B plane sideways into the in, into tunneling. Well, okay, so this is why, you know, I don't actually like this experiment. This was a last resort to, to find that we actually have superconductivity in the sample because you don't know what's happening, okay? And you'll, I, I think you'll, you'll appreciate maybe the answer to your question is coming. So think about what we are doing in tunneling. We are a giga ohm. A giga ohm is like five angstroms away from the sample, okay? And now you ask, you bring the tip close to the sample. What is really happening? 
Well, you know, people's uh, uh, romantic view of our experiment is, is this. You have this very beautiful sample, you have this beautiful tip, and, you know, this is maybe what's happening. You bring it and touch it from a point, and this is a, but this is actually what the real experiment looks like. This is how the, what the curves look like in, when you're blind, you're not imaging anymore. So when they're tunneling, they get a curve like this, but then they start bringing the tip closer and closer. And these are in the micro siemens, okay? So at first uh, they move the, move the sample a, a good, you know, uh, a, you know, one nanometer, 10 angstroms, okay? They still get a V-shape, they still get a V-shape. They have to go a good bit closer. What is happening here in the experiment? Well, probably what's happening is something like this, and actually maybe even more violent. Because if you actually read off the numbers in our experiment, it's, if you're around 20 kilo ohm, which is roughly when you have a quantum of conductance, we actually still get a V-shaped curve. And it's only after we get up to like, you know, five kilo ohms or so, where you have multiple channels uh, of conductance in the perfect world of transmission one, which may not be tr true here, I doubt it's true. That's when you get this very enhanced conductivity and wave signal. And now it's not completely clear what's happening. Maybe what we are doing is we have brought the tip so close that we are actually sideways conducting. Maybe we are basically doing under reflection in the side of the sample effectively. Now, there are a lot of questions that are not resolved. Is the tip uh, doing that? Or is the tip uh, in this case is actually a potential impurity uh, for the D-wave superconductor creating an Andreev state. So we still need to work all of this out, but I am encouraged by, by this data because after their theory, I went to the lab and they said, let's look at this curve. This looks more like their theory in terms of where the regime of the experiment would be a point contact. And maybe actually this is all uh, consistent. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, five minutes. Uh, we have a little more time. Okay, well, I'm almost there anyway. So let me show you another curious experiment. The question was asked is, does the alignment with boron nitride matter? It matters a lot. So I showed you experiments that people have done where they see uh, this uh, uh, churn insulator um, um, in actually it, uh, kind of almost quantum Hall state. Uh, we also see that state actually, here it is. Um, this is a sample which actually has perfect commensuration in this region between the boron nitride and the, and the, uh, the bilayer graphene, such that the, the morays are just, they line up and make this very beautiful uh, uh, structure on the, on the AA sites. Uh, this is the same kind of data again. Uh, this is spectroscopy. You notice there is this giant gap, and now we can do this point contact measurement, and we can say, oh, look, this is an insulator. Okay, a charge neutrality, and that's what you expect to see. Open up gap at the direct points. Uh, there is a, there seems to be somewhat an insulator here around nu equals plus two in this sample, and this is the nu equals uh, plus three insulator. Actually, actually, if you follow this with a magnetic field, you can measure its churn number, and its churn number is one, as it was discovered uh, with the transport studies. But look down here. Uh, this is a millikelvin. There is still a Van Hoel singularity uh, associated with the, with the flat bands. This sample shows nothing. It shows no pseudo gap physics. It shows no superconductivity, okay? And this is consistent with the anecdotal evidence from transport colleagues, which when they get an online sample, they haven't seen a superconductor yet. But this is actually a sample where you can go back and forth and say, oh, this is actually aligned. We really know it's aligned. It has a transport signature of nu equals plus three, and it, it, uh, it is not superconductor. So uh, what is the conclusion of this? The conclusion must be that maybe the pseudo gap phase, you know, first of all, is very sensitive to this breaking of symmetry, the superconductivity, C2T symmetry. And it looks like the pseudo gap phase is also, uh, it just uh, disappears. There's a question there. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Good. So I'm pretty much done. So, uh, um, well, I can actually, if I have a moment, then I can speculate about what we're working on. Uh, so let me just review this, uh, the V-shaped gap, the very large gap to TC ratio. Uh, there is also a very curious effect. 
which is that if you if you integrate this Andreev signal and and uh, watch this Andreev signal as a function of temperature, how it vanishes. I showed you that it goes away at at TC. It vanishes linearly, which is very strange. And this strange behavior has also been observed in strontium ruthenate and you, uh, and actually some uh, heavy fermion superconductors previously in Andreev reflection experiments as well. Uh, there was some interpretation associated with that, which I won't get into here, uh, but um, but it had to do with nodal superconductivity. So let me tell you what we are working on now. So looking ahead, uh, we want to understand the nature of the insulating state, and how are we going to how are we going to do that? And uh, it looks like uh, working uh, with uh, Andre and also. Uh, Mike Zalato has uh, comparable work and in collaboration with us. You'll see where some of these ideas come from. Um, they have basically computed different types of correlated insulating states, and they have computed this local density of states in real space. And these states have real, you know, some of them have very sharp signatures if you can map their wave function in real space on the atomic scale. And the motivation partially for this, these works came from actually a recent experiment we've done where we uh, look, we went back to monolayer graphene. And there has been this mystery about what happens in monolayer graphene uh, when you half fill the zero lambda level. So remember, monolayer graphene has four flavors of electrons, uh, two spin and two valley, two of them. And uh, the question is, what kind of a state do you get? From transport studies, we know we get these broken symmetry states every time we go filling a quarter of such a manifold. Uh, one of them, the first one is kind of obvious. You, you, op, you populate, for example, you know, a, a spin or a valley state is a spin polarized ferromagnet. The one at half filling is not obvious what you could get. Theoretically, there are basically two candidates. You can get a canted antiferromagnet. So, every, so you have the graphene, you have two electrons. Uh, on two sites, on AB sublattice, the two electrons can be antiferromagnetic, or they could make a what they, we call a Kakule state, or some people would call a valence bond uh, state. Okay, so we just learning how to do these experiments on magic angle graphene. We kind of have realized how to do experiments without tip uh, perturbing the sample. And uh, what you see here is a lambda level spectroscopy of just graphene in a magnetic field. These are lambda levels, these sharp lines. And what this is here is the zeroth lambda level. And you can see it's broken up into pieces. And that's breaking up into the different broken symmetry states of the zeroth lambda level. And the question is, you know, which of these states do you have? And um, what we see is that the system actually makes this uh, valence bond crystal, it makes this calculate state. And the way we see that is just by imaging on the atomic scale, uh, you can actually see uh, uh, the signature uh, of this uh, uh, bond state on the, on the sublattice of graphene. And uh, essentially from this experiment, we kind of realized that from this kind of data, the Fourier transform of this kind of data, the real and imaginary part of this, we can actually get a lot of information about the nature of valley polarization in the sample, the nature of valley coherence in the sample. So when you make different kinds of coherent states, uh, when you have the, the phase of the wave function being different between these two valleys, actually the local density of state is different. So let me just put that up uh, as, as something that is a technique we have developed. And it has a lot of applications. You can actually watch these states form as you, as you turn on the magnetic field. And I see the chairman is getting nervous here. And uh, it has a lot of application to this problem, uh, to be able to tease out uh, basically what's the nature of the states by actually looking at the wave function and their Fourier analysis. Uh, and there's a lot of information there. The problem is, as we start working on this, we realize we need data, which is a little bit ridiculous. You need data which has atomic resolution of maybe tens of more sites where you can actually get enough information to rule out different states from one another. So that's, that's a kind of very hard data to get because you need absolutely pristine samples and be able to get really, really high resolution uh, uh, on a very large scale. So let me stop there and just put up my summary slide and see if there are any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. So it's open to questions. First sector, sir. In, in, in the transport measurement, they use the HBN encapsulated samples, right? Where there's a there's HBN, HBN on both sides. Both sides. So does it matter in the tunneling experiment? You have HBN on one side. So it probably that... matters. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's very sensitive. So I think we have heard experiments from transport colleagues where they think one of the BN is aligned, but the other one is not. I mean, so I think our experiment is simpler. Just vacuum. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So maybe you said that they miss it about the pseudo gap of this unconventional superconducting behavior. So you, you show that with the magnetic field, the pseudo gap survives to very large field. But what does it do in temperature? Does it Same. close it to C? No, it survives above to C. Same. Yeah. Well, and what is the, the critical, the T star? So where does it close? It's a baby six Kelvin or something, five, six. Kelvin, five or six five Kelvin. Kelvin. Yeah. Okay, so it's really light in a sense, cooperates in yeah. a sense. Okay, yeah. thanks. All right. Uh, Ali, question about the first, first part of your talk about cascade. With mm -hmm. apologies that I asked a similar question before, but that was about experiment. Now I want to ask about the model. So suppose I start with charge neutrality and yeah. then move in the either direction, positive, new, or negative. As far as I understand in the, in the model that you have, there are components of initially 440 generate peak that start moving one after the other. Mm -hmm. And the relative and the scale is U. Or or or, e, or delta E naught. E, yeah. Those those are the two, those are the only energy uh, right. numbers in the problem. And then keep moving. And then you reach new equal to either plus four or minus four. That's right. And they have to recombine. And again, because bandwidth in your case is zero, essentially they have to recombine back at zero energy. Because again, only four components move, four other components don't. Yes. And at the end of the day, bandwidth between the two is, is because you neglect hopping, bandwidth is zero. As you started, you said that originally you have before. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think. I think you're talking about the spectral weight of these features. No, no, no. I'm asking about positions. You started by saying that you have very narrow band of 12 MeV. Yes. And there are two uh, fourfold generate peaks. Mm -hmm. And then components of one of them start moving. Components of the other probably don't move. Well, I, I, I think what happens is this, is that actually we can go through this in detail. Each of the lines in this calculation corresponds to different type of excitation you can make. You can add an electron, remove an electron, yeah. and add an electron and pay no U, add an electron and pay a U, remove an electron, gain a U. So all of those, you just have to go through all the different possibilities. So that's what all these lines are. Right, but at some point, the distance between these lines is uh, U. And then, the maybe distance... simple question, do they, I see the, the picture. So they recombine back into fourfold, two fourfold degenerate peak close to each other. That's right. So there is a movement to one side, and then there is a movement back. I, 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 maybe you're talking about how they go out and they come back in. Yes. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then again, the question about experiment: Do we see anything like this in experiments that moves move one direction and then comes back? Um, it's all a blur. To, just to be completely honest, right? But uh, the fact, I think the thing that this model gives you is that the chemical potential is doing these jumps. Mm -hmm. But the right. chemical potential has this very weird cusp-like behavior, which this model doesn't recover. Now, Biao did an exact diagonalization with like some number of sites with a little bit of T. And he, we could, with mother's loving eye, we could just say, oh, it does kind of look like a feature that's not jumping, but it's, but it's, you know, kind of smoothly changing and so on. I haven't looked at the detail, but um, so some of the features are resembling one. For example, the, the plus and minus features at, at this point, they may go out a little bit further. I'm not sure, but also, um, yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's hard to tell. 
and I think because of the time, I'm going to this is the closest proximity effect. I, I also I have a question about the double gap structure. So first of all, uh, with the Andrea reflection, so you, I guess you do have some fit to BTK, but from the data you showed us at the end, you have very kind of dirty uh, uh, conductance at the when you bring the tip closer. So how, how much can I actually trust this uh, this uh, four to six uh, delta over TC? Ah. Uh, in terms, does the line ship really fit the BTK formula or do you have to do? All I want to say is the energy scale for Andre reflection signal is smaller. Small. That's true. And, the, the second... I, I, and that's very consistently happening. And how well do the two gaps extrapolate to similar TCs? The, the gap, one of the gap doesn't care about TC. The tunneling gap doesn't care Just about it. Just goes straight like that. Because yeah. you had some kind of thing no. that looked like a square root. But... Ah, oh, okay. That's that's the gap fitting to the the BTK model for for the Andreev reflection. That one looks a little bit square root like. Okay. Yes. Uh, I want to ask about the last part of your talk where you mentioned the Kikuli state disappearing. Did you look into that region where it disappears, and did you see any changes? Because that's basically quantum critical point, right? Yeah. Disappearing as a function of density. Um, I don't, it was too quick for me to ah, see. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. So there are two transitions that we see. One is as a function of field. So as you, the calculus state actually appears as you turn on the field above a critical point. And that critical point is determined by the AB sublattice potential created by the boron nitride substrate. Uh, the, it, it, the system either would like to make a valley polarized state or it can make a calculate state. When that potential is weak, it will say, ah, I'll make, a, I'll make a calculate. And you can tilt the balance with the magnetic field. So we haven't studied that critical point very carefully, but, but there is a very nice critical point. And we have checked as we twist the boron nitride angle relative to graphene, the po this point actually shifts in magnetic field very precisely. Yeah, it is an interesting thing to think about, but we haven't studied carefully what happens at that transition. Thank you. Okay. All right. I know there are more questions, but uh, uh, please I'll ask questions to Ali, probably. Hello. <laughs> so just, okay, just to, be, just to be fair. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Ali on my time. So the next question, next speaker is Francisco Guinea.